Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Joe Confino speaking. We're going to be starting in a minute or so. Um, it would be great, actually, while we're waiting, um, yeah, just a couple of things to keep your videos off and make sure you're on mute. And also, it'd be great if you can use the chat box just to literally put in a, a few words or a sentence on just what you hope to achieve from the session today. So what, why have you joined and what you ha hope to gain from it? And then we'll make sure that we are um, trying to keep to that. So just pop something in the chat. How are you? What you're hoping to get? And then we'll start in a minute. And Joe, the people's names, so we know who we've got in the conversation. Oh, yes, yes, thank you, Sally. Yes, if you can put your names in, and just so we know where, where you are. That would be wonderful. Great, thanks for the, those of you who are starting to use the chat. Keep going. Inspiration and wisdom. Yes, we all want some of that. We're relying on you to give us that today, Sally. Gosh. Great, um, so um, we're going to get underway. So uh, thank you everyone who's joined for today. Uh, my name is Joe Confino and I'm gonna be facilitating this session. Um, alongside Sally Uren, who's the CEO of Forum for the Future. And um, she's going to be sharing insights from um, their big new report called The Future of Sustainability, which was actually launched yesterday. Um, as we go along, uh, it would be great um, if you can post questions or comments in the chat room, and we'll be monitoring those and bringing those into the conversation. Um, but also, um, if you're on Twitter and you want to just share what's going on, uh, there are two Twitter handles. One is the hashtag time to transform. And the other is hashtag future of sust. That's future of and then S-U-S-T. Um, just as we're waiting for a few more people to join, we're just going to play one video to get us all in the mood for today. So if we can just play that video, that would be wonderful. Great. Um, and just as a reminder to everyone, obviously we're going to be talking about uh, the Future Sustainability Report, but it's also part of, you know, uh, the new um, section of Forum for the Future. So do go to their new section, uh, the Future Centre, and um, see what's up, because there's going to be lots of news coming out there in the future. Um, just to say, um, just to give you a sense of how this session is going to go, there are going to be three parts to it. Um, first of all, we're going to get Sally. Uh, who's going to talk about, um, just give us a, a sense of what's in the report, what's important, what uh, the future holds for us, or the different, um, different sections. I mean, they're, they're basically, you know, we know we're at a crossroads, and we know that there are different roads we can take. And I think one of the beautiful things about this report is it really just gives us a sense of if we don't act, if we do act, where are we going, how are we going to get there? So um, Sally's going to be doing that. Then we're going to have a fantastic panel discussion 
Um, and then the third section will be for you to be directly involved. We're going to do breakout sessions where we're going to ask you how you can act to create change. So that's how we're going to go. Um, one thing uh, we're going to do now is just actually just do a little, pan a little poll just to see actually who's in the room. Um, are you from business? Are you from the charity sector? Are you from government? And that will just give us a sense of uh, who's here. So if you can just, uh, we're just going to pop that up now. And if you can just fill that in, then we'll see the results as soon as they're there. Great. Okay. Well, um, now we know who's here. Um, one thing I should have mentioned also is uh, we did do a launch the report uh, for um, people in Asia, or um, I mean, there were people from all over the world, but it's primarily for the Asian market uh, yesterday. And, and at some point during the session, Sally will also feed back to what came up there. But Sally, over to you. Thank you, Joe. Um, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you all. Well, we'll see you all later, but great that you made the time to join us today um, because we're super excited to launch the latest Future of Sustainability report. And um, I think if we can just move on to the next slide, please, Sophia. Great. Just a moment to reflect on the backdrop against which we're launching this report and really a backdrop where we've seen the first shock of this decade. And we are all living through a moment of deep discontinuity and uncertainty. And we have no idea how long it's going to last. But what we do know is that COVID-19 has really shone a light on the deep interconnectivity between the systems we rely on. And particularly the interconnectivity to, between planetary health and human health, social justice, economic health. And the other really remarkable thing about COVID-19 is that it has literally affected everything. The next slide uses one of our favorite metaphors that fall on the iceberg. And I think it is worth reflecting that COVID has affected not just the way information flows, not just the way that we live and we work, but how we feel about things, our value sets, our emotions. And whilst on the one hand, that feels deeply, deeply unsettling and has delivered profound uncertainty into our lives because literally everything is changing. There is a moment in time to harness all of that dynamism and actually to begin to create the future that we want. And what we would say is that actually there is now a short but closing window to do exactly that. Christiana Figueres talked about this a few weeks ago and really echoes an observation that we've had at Forum, which is we began 2020 thinking that 2020s would be the decade of delivery. We've got 10 years to respond to the climate emergency, the biodiversity emergency, to really deal once and for all for very deep, in, for, for deep root of structural issues. But actually, I think that window has shrunk because so much has been changed over the last few months. And if we think about all of the stimulus packages that governments are announcing around the world, and also just reflect on the profound shift in everything around us, what we do next has never really mattered more. And that really speaks to the importance of mindsets. So the way we feel about things, the stories we tell, the narratives, and increasingly in our work at Forum, when we're trying to understand how to create deep systems transformation, we increasingly go back to the fact that mindsets are really critical. That's the deep rooted seat of change. And so we wanted to run another poll actually and ask you, how are you feeling? So how has your optimism about our ability to create a better world change since the start of the pandemic? Are you still passionately optimistic if indeed you were in the first place? Are you cautiously hopeful bearing in mind that so much has changed and therefore we can reconfigure systems around us. Is it simply just too soon to tell or actually are you now feeling more pessimistic? Take a moment to think about how you feel about this moment in time. A 
Oh, here are the results. Um, very similar to the poll that we ran at this point in the conversation yesterday. In fact, almost identical. And interestingly, really similar to the poll we ran on Twitter the day before yesterday. We've been asking people this question a lot. Um, so nearly half of you are feeling cautiously hopeful that we might be able to use this movement of discontinuity to reset. Um, I love the 13% passionate optimist. Um, we had a brilliant conversation yesterday about the importance of what um, one of the panelists described as gritty, stubborn optimism. And I'm sure that might be a feature of the conversation today as well. And then, yeah, 15% more pessimistic. And I think there are good reasons for that. And then a number, gonna sit on the fence, too soon to tell. So thank you for that. We'll see how you feel as we go through this conversation. But what we are offering in the launch of our report is a way in to understand the change in the world around us and some suggestions for what we might do to harness this particular moment in time. For those of you that are still joining, please go into the chat and just share your name where you are geographically or where you are metaphorically, we don't mind, but just a little bit of sharing in the chat would be great. And just to remind you um, that if you have any questions, please start to pose them in the chat. But what I'm gonna do now is to run through some of the highlights of the report, which is downloadable from our Future Center. Um, this is a digital platform we've had for a while at Forum, but we've just revamped it to host the future of sustainability. So please do take a look after this session. And I'm going to describe, well, three things really. First up, a number of dynamic areas that we think are going to be really important for the next decade. Then how those areas might play out in the form of four trajectories. And then I'm just gonna finish up with um, a sneak peek of some of our call to action to different parts of the system around us. So I'm going to run through all these five in turn, and I'm gonna start with the biosphere breakdown. Um, so this is a cluster of trends, tipping points, which on the one hand feels very familiar, um, certainly was dominating the conversation at the start of this year. But I think what COVID has done has really shone a light on a very, very big question. So can we actually use the fact that we have really suddenly more so than ever appreciated the interconnectivity of planetary health and human health social justice, can we use that awareness to actually really act profoundly now and very deliberately to ensure we don't reach some of these biosphere tipping points? And the questions that we're asking within this dynamic area, will we see the necessary international cooperation critical when we think about dealing with the climate emergency? Will we see more of these nature-based solutions that are really looking at harnessing ecosystems to provide resilience? And will we see new models of ecosystem justice with social justice rooted at their heart? So a hugely dynamic area, possible that we might solve some of these challenges in a decade, but equally a lot of uncertainty in this dynamic area, but it's certainly still there, hasn't gone away in the light of COVID. If you move on to the second dynamic area, and this is really looking at the economic system. And the big question that we're holding here is, how can we use this profound change to ensure that the economic model that we had before COVID, which we know wasn't a model that was delivering social justice, it wasn't a model that was delivering climate justice, it certainly wasn't a model that was delivering the solutions for our climate emergency. How can we ensure that this economic model shifts from an extractive one, where we're just taking things out of the ecosystem, an economic that works for the few to one that really enables thriving people and a thriving planet. There's a possibility of re-engineering the economic system. So it broadens out in terms of its goals, goals that would meet the need of everyone around us. So big questions here are, will we see recovery packages that put um, sustainability at their heart that really stimulate a response to the climate emergency? Or will we just see a replication of the debt relieved model that we saw after the 2008 crisis. Will we see a global settlement on debt relieved? And will this brilliant notion and a notion that's gaining a lot more traction very recently, 
will stakeholder capitalism really come to the fore? So in other words, how do we use this moment in time to reform our economic model, to allow it to create the enabling conditions for us all to thrive? That's on area number two. Number three is this um, really interesting fusion of trends around technology and also governance. And really big central question here is, will technology lock us into the unsustainable trajectory that we were on before COVID, or could it really enable this um, regenerative future to flourish? And some of the questions we're asking in here are, can AI really deliver the sustainable development goals? A recent paper in Nature said that that could possibly happen. Can all this technology help us protect our ecosystems? But critically, will we see the participatory governance stru structures, the enabling regulation, that means that we see equitable access to digitalization, and trend that's really accelerated over the COVID crisis? And when it comes to power, will we see continued centralization of power, which we were seeing before the crisis, or will we see decentralization of power to work for communities? A lot of uncertainty, again, in this particular dynamic area. Number four is, again, another really dynamic area where we're looking at trends and tipping points related to key societal transitions, ones that need to be put in train. So how might we use this moment in time to really once and for all deal with deep rooted structural inequalities and deliver social justice? And then trends and tipping points that are just on their way. So by 2025, 75% of the working population will be millennial or Gen Zs. So a really incredibly positive intergenerational transition point is about to happen. What does that mean for the societal transitions that we know we need to see? And then the fifth and the final dynamic area, and the one that is moving very, very quickly, is a dynamic area that we've called regenerative openings. And this is really where we're seeing huge energy looking at alternative business models, business models that shift from extraction to actually value creation, societal and environmental value creation. This is where we're seeing aspects such as regenerative agriculture practices really beginning to scale. And this is where we are asking that big question, which is, can we shift the goals of the food system, the health system, the economic system from extracted to regenerative? So can we push sustainability one step further and actually reconfigure all of our systems so that they're capable of really allowing us to flourish as people and as our planet? So five dynamic areas, all set to have a profound influence over the next decade, but just how might they interact? And one of the ways we've tried to understand that is by plotting four trajectories. So four plausible possible pathways forward from this moment in time. And I'm going to briefly take you through them all. We're gonna end with the one that we're most excited about at Forum. So stay with me. Some of them are a little bit more unsettling than others. But these trajectories are really a guide to understanding what might happen next, making sense of all this uncertainty around us. And they are all interconnected. If we move on to the next slide, we see here that actually these are four possible pathways emerging from the COVID discontinuity, but they do overlap. And the important thing to mention about these four trajectories is they're all happening right now. In one working day, you can experience all four. So moving on to the trajectories then. Up first, we have a trajectory called disciplined. And for each of these trajectories, we have articulated the mindset, the story, the narrative that really is the architecture of this trajectory. And in discipline, the, the underlying mindset is that we need greater control to protect our public health. Public health comes first before privacy concerns, and we need strong government. And we really need to keep the current economic model running because that's the model we understand. And, you know, it's sort of, it's doing okay question mark. But this is a model where we just see centralized government and a real ramping up of technology. We see rapid um, technological innovation in global supply chains without really thinking about questions around a just transition. And we return to some form of global globalization, very centralized power dynamics. That's disciplined. 
we move on to the next trajectory. We call this compete and retreat. And the mindset here is that there just isn't enough to go around. There isn't enough to share. And this is where we see an increased uprising in nationalism and nationalist in interests. And this is the mindset where we say, actually, our nation's survival is what comes first. And we will trade, we will interact with others, but only if we get something in return. And this is really a trajectory where international cooperation really falters. We may see quite chaotic shortening of global supply chains, quite chaotic regionalization, and potentially even the end of multilateralism. So this is a trajectory where the nations that have access to resources will do okay. Those that don't really will struggle. So issues around climate justice are really difficult to tackle in this trajectory. Moving on to the unsettled trajectory. And we had a big debate at forum whether this was in fact a trajectory or was this just the underlying drumbeat that we could expect over the next few years. And we do think it is a possible trajectory, just recognizing that over the last few months we have seen crisis within crisis. That could continue. And the mindset here is that there might not ever be a new normal and that the world has become a very strange and volatile place. And actually on the light side, we can adopt radical resilience. We can be really adaptive. We can embody emergence as a way of dealing with all of these shifts around us. But this is a trajectory with continuous discontinuity. The fourth trajectory, the one that we want to pay most attention to at Forum, and I hope you will too, is called Transform. And we'd just like to play a little video. Imagine a world in which COVID-19 prompts a realisation that the fates of people and planet are intertwined. Individuals, organisations and governments recognise the reality of deep turbulence and begin to operate from radically changed assumptions. Disruption is used as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to think and act differently. Systemic inequalities and environmental destruction are no longer accepted sparking intense attempts to tackle long-neglected issues. Early momentum comes from grassroots organisations, city initiatives and pioneering businesses who begin to redefine their core purpose. In some parts of the world, governments take bold action as popular support for change grows. We accept we are part of, not separate from, natural systems and that they play a vital role in everything from reducing the risk of pandemics to sequestering carbon. This helps unlock the financial investment and international action needed to protect them, with a growing focus on regenerative approaches designed to deliver a socially just and sustainable future. These are just examples, and Transform is just one possible future. But the decisions we make right now will determine our path. Great, so that's transform and it really does underline that actually what we do next has never really mattered more. And the mindset here is that planetary health, human well-being come first and that all of these issues are deeply interconnected. And it's this trajectory that we see a just transition. We see a broadening out of the goals of the, of the global economy to facilitate that. And we see a scaling of um, Kate Rayworth's donor economics. We see a scaling of these new business models. And this is a trajectory where resilience, social equity, regeneration are at its core. But it won't be easy. Um, we do know it's time to transform. We do know that we can use this moment to deal with some really deep rooted challenges that we haven't dealt with over the last few years. But we believe now is a time to tackle them and it will require us all to lean into our power, our privilege, who we are, all of us, all different actors from across the global economy, the glo global society to play a role. So the final um, 
thing I wanted to leave you with, thing that's very imprecise, isn't it? It's a call to action. Um, the third part of the report is setting out what we at Forum think might need to happen next. It's a contribution. It's not all the answers. Nobody has all the answers by any stretch of the imagination. But what is very clear is that we need all actors within our system to work together and to do things differently. We need business to ensure that the purpose is around creating a regenerative system. And we need to end procurement practices that really and build, as, build at that extractive model rather than shifting to a regenerative model. We also need businesses to advocate with governments to create the enabling policy environments that are so needed to deliver the shifts in our economy and our society. We need governments around the world to align their stimulus packages with Green New Deal principles, more of what we're seeing in Europe, more of what we're seeing in Hawaii. We need governments to develop plans for a just transition and to think about how do, we, how do we scale really participatory, if I could say it would help, participatory multi-stakeholder approaches to democracy, bringing in the voices of the many. Investors, really critical. Their mission must be to deliver value in the broadest sense, not just financial value, delivering societal value, natural capital value really using that creativity to develop innovative financial instruments to enable a transition from the current economic model, which just doesn't work for sustainability, to one that would, and to broaden and deepen out our ESG risk. And then philanthropy, bringing in participatory approaches to grant making, talking with those that are closest to the challenges that we face, bringing them into the decision making, and looking beyond quantifiable outcomes, investing more broadly in the capacity of grantees, and then civil society, all of us, we need to collaborate deeper and better. The nonprofit sector is not brilliant when it comes to collaboration. We need to see more collaboration. And as civil society organizations, as we are at Forum for the Future, test new models are working, organizing for the change that we want to see. So that's just a snapshot of some of the call to action in the report. But I hope now we can pick up the conversation and understand what can we do to really enable Transform to emerge. And thank you again to our report partners. Back to you, Joe. Wow, um, thank you, Sally. Um, there's so much in there. I mean, it's, it's amazing that, we, uh, you know, what I, what I love about this report is, is all this complexity you brought in a way that our minds can actually can get our minds rounded. And of course, everything in that report would have been valid uh, before COVID in, in the same way, but I think what you're saying is COVID has, shown this sort of thin veneer of our civilization that actually, you know, unless we act now, these shocks will become bigger and actually we will not be able to deal with them, that we're, we're hardly able to deal with this one in an intelligent uh, way. So, so when the next one comes, how we place. Um, so thank you for that. We're now gonna jump into our panel discussion. So I'm just gonna introduce who we've got. Uh, we've got uh, Ilza Mel Melngelis, who is the Senior Director of Global Partnerships and of the Business Council from, for the UN. We've got Jeffrey Hollander, Chair of the American Sustainable Business Council and founder of Seventh Generation. We've got Roman Krasnarik, the philosopher and author of The Good Ancestor. And we've got Dez Agaji, who's a climate justice activist. So um, the four of you are very welcome. I, Roman, actually, I want to start with you. Um, it would be good because there's so much in that report. Um, does it sort of, does that chime with uh, your thinking? Is anything you think is missing? Anything you would critique? Just, just to get a sense of it. What I love about the report is the long-term vision, getting us to think not on the scale of minutes and seconds and hours, but on the scale of years and decades and beyond, because the kinds of crises we're facing this century are ultimately long-term crises. We're in the immediacy of COVID, but there is the next pandemic on the horizon. There are threats from new technologies. There's racial injustice being passed on from generation to generation. And of course, there's the global ecological crisis in all its forms. And so I love the idea of the transform um, pathway because it spurs us on to think about not just transforming our economies, the donut economy, B Corps, the whole regenerative um, mindset, but it also recognizes the importance of government. And I think the politics is so important here because I believe that we have colonized the future. We treat it like a distant colonial outpost where we can freely dump ecological degradation and technological risk 
as if there was nobody there. And you can have all the SDGs in the world that you want, but unless your governmental systems have long-term thinking inside their DNA and structures, it's gonna be very hard to progress. And that's why I'm very impressed by places like Wales that has a future generations commissioner. Or in Japan, there's a wonderful movement called Future Design where they invite local residents to draw up plans for the towns and cities where they live. And in one form, what they do is they break them into two groups. Half of them are told they're residents from the present day. And the other half are given these ceremonial robes to wear and told to imagine themselves as residents from the year 2060. And it turns out that the residents from 2060 come up with far more transformative city plans from healthcare investment to climate change action. And this movement in Japan is actually inspired by the seventh generation decision-making principle found in many Native American, American communities. So I'd like to see, going back to Sally's idea of participatory democracy, this is the kind of model which I think can bring revitalized democracy when it's under pressure from far right populism, but also helps spur on a new regenerative economy. So, so Rim, that, that's all great in principle, but, um, but I think one of the things is, you know, for the last, uh, at least in the West, for the last 200 years, we haven't been thinking about future generations where you haven't hardly been in, have time to think of the present moment. We're sort of all racing around. And we're dealing with, um, with a very complex society in crisis and people trying to cope with day-to-day -day issues. And you're asking them to look at sort of, you know, a hundred years ahead or whatever. How, how does the rubber hit the road? So you've given this example in, in Japan, which is great, but, but is this really doable? And, and, and what are the steps to this? So if, if we're talking about any country in the West, let's say the US, how do we start to make that real as opposed to just the pipe dream? I think ultimately you've got to start deeply inside yourself and realize that we are intergenerational beings. We can look back to our grandparents, maybe further than that, and we can, if we have children, look forward to our grandchildren even. So I think about my daughter who's 11 years old and I sometimes imagine her when she's 90 at her 90th birthday party, surrounded by family and friends and loved ones and communities and neighbors. And I go and look outside the window. What kind of world is she living in? And then I look into her face and try to think about what kind of world do we need to create so she can survive and thrive into the long future. And, and when I think about my own daughter living there at the end of the 21st century, I realize she's not alone. She's part of a web of communities and, and people, and she's part of the web of the living world, the air she breathes, the water she drinks. And I think we can all go on these little imaginative journeys, which can sometimes be quite confronting, especially if we've got a, a dark vision of the future, um, but they help us make a connection from something very personal to something more transcendent. And obviously some cultures have that, you know, like the seventh generation decision-making idea, but in hyper-capitalist individualistic Western culture, it takes much more of an effort. But I think we do need to start with a personal and then connect it with those bigger transformative economic political changes. And I mean, what, how do we start to do that? Because I mean, I once brought Joanna Macy into The Guardian to do a, a day's workshop of connecting to the past and the future. But how do we actually start to, to make that happen? Because actually what, what a lot of the report is saying and is it's about mindset change, isn't it? Action comes from changing your mind. When you change your mind, the world changes around you. How do we start to work with people um, in, in literally in a country in a, with policy, with, with thinking? How do we start to make that happen? Well, I'm gonna be a bit naughty and share my screen. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to do that, but you can see in the little green circle is everyone who's alive today, 7.7 .7 billion of us. And over the last 50,000 years, nearly 100 billion people have been born and died. And in the next 50,000 years, both of those are far outweighed by the nearly 7 trillion people will be born. Will be born. And even in the next couple of centuries alone, tens of billions of people will inhabit the earth. And we need to think about them looking over our shoulders and we need to get um you know there there is a movement i believe of time rebels around the world people who are committed to everyone in that orange circle there are people like that future design movement in japan there are people committed to the circular economy and i think we can all find places in these different kinds of long-term regenerative uh, movements and organizations and really ask ourselves a very simple question joe which is am i being a good ancestor when i'm making decisions, whether, whether I'm 
buying some beans in a supermarket and they're from Kenya and they've flown in an airplane and am I happy with those carbon emissions or not? Or whether I am working as a public servant in the foresight department in the Singapore government, am I being a good ancestor? I think these are sort of mental shifts which are then steps to more practical change. Great, thank you. Um, Days, what was your sense of uh, the report and, um, you know, and your sense making of where we are? Yeah, I'm in total agreement with Roman. I feel um, the report is, it, it's really whole. And I feel like sometimes the reports kind of focus way too much on the carbon side of things, but without the actual behavior change that we need to actually create sustainable and regenerative. Oh, uh, you've gone on, uh, okay, you're back. I'm back. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think that the report, the fact that it's actually really putting together people and the planet and not things as separate entities, but one that affects the other. Um, and I think that's a really important part, that I, especially in the West, that we need to start recognising. You know, um, I was lucky enough to grow up with my mum from an Indigenous culture in Nigeria, and she always told us our mission in life was to fight for the next generation and make the world a better place for the next generation. And if we start taking those ethos of care and love and compassion for not only ourselves, but people around us and our future generations, that's how we'll start getting sustainability and regeneration at our core. And, and if we are to have a regenerative future, I mean, what, what is the role of in a, dealing with inequality or, or just the broader issue of justice? Because you, you consider yourself a climate justice sort of activist. Well, can you just talk about how important that is because often up till now we've had a lot of sort of we've had climate over here we've had social issues over here um, and we've realized that they are deeply interconnected but can you just talk a bit about what you are experiencing around this yeah exactly they're all so deeply connected and i i feel like for me i always see the climate um crisis as a byproduct of our failing systems so you see you know less take example colonialism. So we learned how to use and abuse each other. We learned how to use each other as resources and we did the same thing to the earth. So without actually correcting those behaviors of learning how to love each other and treat each other with empathy and compassion and have duty to one another, we won't be able to do the same to the earth. And this is where it has to be um, fighting both sides of actually changing the human to be able to, you know, understand their socialization, understand what the world has done to us, but also re-socializing us into being better and taking that into our relationships, taking that into our communities, taking that into the action that we take, especially for the climate, and then bringing that same love to the earth. And I'm, I'm far too young to remember, I'm far, I'm far too young to remember, I'm far too old, you see, I can't remember who, what my age is. I'm far too old to remember what it was like to be young. Um, you know, because when I was growing up, um, climate was a, you know, as a young person, climate was, was, didn't even register. And even 20 years ago, when I knew what was going on, you know, most people didn't know about it. What, what is, can you just talk about the level of consciousness that you are experiencing at the moment and, and whether how quickly that is shifting? Yeah, I feel um, this generation is quite amazing because I feel like all of us are very awake to the ideas of what's happening in our world. And also it's quite scary. Um, I was fortunate enough to be a primary school teacher last year and hearing you know, my six to 10 year old class talk about climate change and the fear of dying um, or talking to 15 year olds who are holding grief about the children that they feel like they can't have. This is the reality of being young in a time like this. It's it's so scary. But at the same time, as like Sally mentioned before, there is that gritty hope that I feel like young people have. It is that really open feeling for to strive for what we've been told is impossible. And I think that's like the, the really important part of this. We are no longer taking no as an answer, especially when it comes to fighting for life. Um, and I think that's the, the, the essence of being young. Thank you. Um, Jeffrey. I just want to come back, come to you really, just following on from Roman, because I mean, he talks about seventh generation and obviously you, you founded seventh generation. It'd be really good just to get a sense of, just to, for those who don't know, just what your thinking was behind that, but also just where did that, what did that do differently? So in other, in other words, you know, where did it get you when you started off that journey with that thinking, what did it change in your thinking and your actions? 
Yeah, well, it's a profound difference, I think, in the way most business operates, particularly in uh, the United States. And what we did, inspired by the Iroquois, was to create a business that was committed to caring for all of its stakeholders and a business that was as committed to protecting the planet and our communities in which we do business in and the employees that work at the company. And that was really very contrary to the way in which business is supposed to be practiced, where the number one beneficiary is supposed to be your shareholders and you're working for them to maximize your profits. And we managed uh, miraculously to deliver well for our shareholders and our other stakeholders at the same time. But this was really not the way in which business is practiced. And today we still face a challenge. We have many businesses saying, we are committed to caring for our stakeholders. The Business Roundtable, for example, 181 executives of the largest multinational companies in the world signed a statement being committed to their stakeholders. And yet at the same time, when COVID hit, the first thing they did was continue to pay out dividends to shareholders while they let their employees go or furlough them. So I think the awareness is there that we need the change and we need to think long term and we need to modify the way in which we're doing business. But I think, as, as Sally has identified in a report, without significant regulatory reform, it will be challenging to implement. But Jeffrey, just to follow up on that, uh, you know, we've seen in many countries that even when, you know, the price of fuel goes up or, or, or even the, 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 the smallest policy changes are put forward, there's this huge um, kickback and people say, you know, we don't want this and you're just adding to our, uh, the cost of our lives. And, and how are we going to get there? Because, because what, what, what the report points out, which we all know, is that we need a radical transformation. We, we, we can't have just more iterative changes because the, the problems run away far faster than the solution. So wh where's, where does that start to happen and how does it start to happen in truth? Well, you might not like my answer, Joe, but, but I'm afraid that it is the climate challenge that we're facing. I'm afraid that it is the social inequity that is just bad and getting worse that will cause very painful and pressure and very painful and uncomfortable pressure to make radical systemic change. The challenge that we have faced in the past is you can't change one part of the system and expect the whole system to follow. You have to change the system. You have to take the system on and you have to look at the whole regulatory landscape. You can't change it one piece at a time, which is really a problem. But I do think that there will be so much pressure from the current crises we're facing that we will have no choice but to open the door and start pursuing more regenerative solutions that cause radical changes in the way business gets done globally. Okay, and just finally, Jeffrey, um, you know, COVID, has produced an instant radical response globally. And yet the climate and inequity uh, you know, crisis is far bigger and more profound than the COVID crisis. Yet that has not brought about that change. How do you explain in your own mind why COVID can create such dramatic transformation, yet the huge problems that are existential by nature are not doing that? Yeah. You know, I think it's the difference between the fear that everyone feels in their day-to-day -day life about COVID relative to many people who have yet to experience the challenges of climate change. Unfortunately, many people are already experiencing the challenges of climate change. They're just not the ones causing the problem. They're the recipients of the industrial West having created really a nightmare for the rest of the world. So there has to be a visceral experience. I mean, if you're clobbered by enough hurricanes, you start to rethink the way you wanna build your future and you think about it in a very different fashion. 
And we have to make these things personal. I think sometimes we are too abstract in the way we talk about these challenges. We have to make them very personal. We have to make them visceral. And we, we have to create a sense of tremendous urgency. As Sally said, we have no time to waste. This is the moment. This is the trigger that we have to use to bring about change that is so far eluded us largely. Great, um, thank you. I'm just gonna bring in Ilse and then I'm gonna come back to you, Sally, just to sort of um, give some early reflections and, and other questions that are coming up. But Ilse, one, one of the things that um, came up in the report was this idea, which we all know is that we need to collaborate, that, that we cannot do things on our own, no company, no country, no, no part of society can do things alone. Can you just talk about, because, you know, part of your core job is around collaboration. Are we seeing, and it'd be good to hear a little bit about that anyway, but are we seeing a real step change in the way people see themselves working together or, or are people still sort of just playing around the edges? That's a great question. And it's a very important question. Um, I am terminally optimistic, uh, but I do, I do see change. And it is around collective action, which we need much more of. But the, the degree of collective action right now is, is, is historic. I do feel like we saw it similarly around the AIDS pandemic, um, you know, about 10 years ago or so. Um, but within the business community alone, the degree of collaboration amongst highly competitive pharmaceutical companies, for example, to rally around delivering a vaccine um, is unprecedented. Um, and not only are they committing to delivering vaccines, but then there is also commitment to deliver equitably around the world. So just last week, a communique was released um, that uh, I think over 20 CEOs signed in, in support of the ACT Accelerator uh, hosted by the World uh, Health Organization and other entities uh, committing business and governments to deliver the vaccines uh, uh, equally and equitably around the world. And all of that feels like, we don't have any data on it, but it feels like the sum total of the experience that everyone has had over the last eight months um, and the expectations that have changed in, in society. That, that, those kinds of commitments are, and, and collaboration are unprecedented. Great. And we need and to, when, we're seeing yeah, it in um, biodiversity and other areas as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, when, when, when you look at the Forum for the Future's new report, you know, it gives these, these four pathways. And of course, life is messy. You're not gonna just get one the exclusion of the other, you're going to get all of them operating at different levels. Mm -hmm. What what do you what do you think is going to happen? So so in, in terms of take, taking that report, the, you know the four pathways. What what's your sense of how do how are you making sense of that? Where are we going? Um, that's interesting. Well, first let me just say I, I think the report is tremendously valuable, and for um, the following reason, which is the answer to your question. Um, I like to think that we're going to move toward the transform trajectory and we will, as, as Sally said, move in and out of the other trajectories, uh, which are very real forces that we're facing. Um, but I don't think we're going to do it unless we have a communications mandate attached to this. So at the recent UN General Assembly, I'd say one of the big themes emerging um, was a commitment to act now. It's you know enough talking, more action. And people have said that before, but there was more import to it this year than I've ever heard before. So I'd say those of us who those of us who attend meetings like this, who read reports like this, whose jobs it is to support sustainability, um, are getting pretty clear and have a front seat at the table to understand what needs to be done to bring about sustainability. But I think what we really need is to take the genius of the analysis of this report and, and find ways to communicate en masse, um, both to people that hold power that are not yet um, enlightened, for lack of a better word, so the CEOs, the policymakers, the, the, the local government leaders, um, and then all the way to, you know, like the vision of Richard Curtis around Project Everyone to have every citizen of the world um, to be aware of the, the forces that we're all grappling with um, right now. So in, in essence, I think the genius of the report and why it's so important is because it, it maps the real forces that are really going on and that, that you know, we have the, the vision of the sustainable development goals 
And so many people are bought into it, which is, which is what we need. But there are so many forces um, around it that this report captures. And if we don't look those in the eye and honestly embrace what is really going on in the zeitgeist and in the hearts and minds of people, we won't make the progress that we have to make. So number one, that's why the report is so important in my mind. And then second, as you asked, I think that we do need to find ways to communicate beyond kind of the, the echo chamber that we all live in, in this group of colleagues who we know and love, but there are many others that need to be brought on board if we're going to be successful. Great, thank you, Ilse. Um, Sally, any, um, anything coming up in the chat box that you want to highlight or any reflections on what's been said so far? Yes, it's a veritable folly of activity in the chat box. Um, I just also wanted to um, draw some strands across from the conversation yesterday, actually. And in fact, Ilse, your last point came up really strongly yesterday, which is when we got to the conversation about well, what is it that we need to do differently, getting out of our bubble and communicating to those individuals and organizations with whom this is not on their radar was mm -hmm. really critical. So that was a theme echoed yesterday. And another theme that was echoed yesterday, and I think really speaks days to your contribution, um, was this whole notion of meaning versus outcome. Um, so I have a 19 year old daughter and she like you is, she's passionate about going out and, and really addressing some of these deep rooted issues, particularly around climate. Um, yet she's also terrified. And, and she and her friends are talking about, well, will we ever have children? And, and it just breaks your heart. But what keeps her going is that there's meaning in her activism. So when she goes marching after Trafalgar Square with a homemade banner, she's doing it because she really cares. And so that for me feels really important, not only as a flavor of yesterday's conversation, but today, which is meaning is so important. And that then links to this whole notion of mindset, the stories we, we tell ourselves. And that is, is so powerful. And I think is one of the ways that perhaps we can bring a broader cohort into this conversation. So I'm just struck by there are real similarities between today's conversations and yesterday's. But Joe, answering your question, questions, questions. Uh, there have two that um, have popped up in a couple of different ways. Um, the first is the tension around, well, actually two tensions, and it would be interested to get people's views on this. First tension, how do you manage the short-term survival versus the long-term, the need to pivot into this transform trajectory. So how, how do we do that um, is one question. So managing that tension between short-term, longer-term. And then the second tension is how do we, and this is probably one for Roman, um, how do we make the current people in power that might not be familiar with this conversation, but they have huge power, how can we encourage them not to be bad ancestors, but to be good ancestors where actually their context is really encouraging them to be bad ancestors? So how do we really change the ancestral, ancestral classification of some of these people in power? So two questions there, Joe. Yeah, thank you. And, and so, Roman, because I, I, I've noticed, that, and I'm terrible at doing two things at the same time, but I have noticed in the, in the chat around, there's been a few comments around power which is, speaks to what Sally, but in a sense more broadly, which is about there's, there's power over and then there's soft power and is, are the power relationships in society changing? So who, who actually does have power mm. and how is that going to be exercised in the future? Maybe um, a broader question for you. Um, well, what comes to mind with that question for me and as people were talking was about the power, where power lies in political decision-making in society. And to my mind, it is far too centralized. And if we are gonna have a long-term vision, we need to devolve power. And the word I haven't heard so far is the word cities. And I think cities are fundamental to the, creating that transform, transformative pathway. If you think of like donut economics, for example, it's been adopted by Amsterdam as part of their co post COVID recovery plan. And in terms of how change happens, well, once Amsterdam uh, adopted the donut, then Copenhagen adopted the donut. So there's an element of peer-to-peer -peer inspiration going on. And I think that is really fundamental for these kinds of transformations. You need to see the models that work 
and then replicate them. In a way, it's not the first city who's the most important, it's the second city that follows, and then the other ones will come. So I think that overall there, there's something important about devolving power, but of course, most national politicians don't want to be giving up their powers to cities, even though we know cities are very good at dealing with long-term problems, like dealing with migration complexities or dealing with climate issues. So these are about social and political struggles, ultimately, that we need to have. That's why, you know, Deza's discussion about the importance of, of, you know, collective action and things like that are really fundamental. And, and Days, bring, let, let me just get Days on this, and then I'll come back to you, but Days, you've been involved in Extinction Rebellion, the school strikes, which are around exercising power in a, in a, in a, in a new way from a bottom up. Well, what's your sense of, have those made any difference? Because, because they've, they've created a lot of, you know, a lot of people have become aware of issues, but there's a there's question mark over, do they actually create the change or do they just create the foundation for a change? It'd be really interesting just to reflect on those two, you know, school strikes, extinction rebellion, have they worked or are they working or actually are you dis disenchanted? Well, yeah, I, I think they are working. Um, even so when I joined XR, it was before the April rebellion and climate change was still something that was quite niche to care about. It was still something that, oh, there was only a certain group of people, mostly white middle-class people who care and the rest of us, we just didn't care. Um, but then actually post April, you saw this massive uprising of people who were saying, I've thought about this or I've never engaged with it. And then now I know how serious it is. What do I do now? You know, and I feel like, especially with the climate strikes as well, engaging, with such young kids and like creating that ethos within them to care um, that's going to be something that will actually end up saving the world in the future and maybe the change doesn't feel so imminent now but like teaching this new like new people who are going to take over society and be the power holders that's what's going to really make the change and I don't think that um, Extinction Rebellion or um, the climate strikes are the only ways to make change. I feel like um, in XR, we call it actually the movement of movements. So we are just one clog in this greater movement ecology. And the more work that everyone does, whether that's petition, petitions, whether that's lobbying, whether that's you know other means of protest, as long as we all do it together, that's what creates the change. And it's this like, you know, um, multi-level effort and even externally to XR, I ran for parliament, I'm currently doing litigation work. So it is like living that kind of, there are other tactics as well, but doing the tactics together is going to create the pressure to make something happen. Great, thank you, Days. Uh, Sally, you were going to um, say something. Oh, I, no, I think we've moved on. Um, but I think there is something coming up in the chat though that really just echoes Days's point, which is, you know, we tend to think as power sometimes is you know, really concentrated in those obvious figures of power. But I think what Dave has just really beautifully articulated is that power can be in communities, it can be in grassroots movements. You know, power is distributed in our ecosystem. And so really understanding all those different levers and creating movements within movements you know, is such a cause for optimism and gives people agency because I think one of, um, the experience that we, we have at Forum often is people feel they don't have any power and they don't have any influence and it's really hard to create the change, but actually we all have a role to play and it isn't just about where you think power lies. It can it lies in all sorts of different places that can be really harnessed in a very positive way. Great, thank you. Um, Jeffrey, I just want to come to you just actually for a, uh, just a moment to talk about, I mean, in part to talk about the short term versus the long term, but but to give a, your sense of what's going on in the US in terms of um, you know, what you see. So even, even if Biden comes in, um, are we gonna see a fundamental shift in America given that you know, America is not the most important country in the world, but it's pretty important and, it, and it's holding so much back. What do you see coming up? There? Yeah. I mean, I think we will absolutely see a positive shift in the right direction I think there's no question about that. The, the thing that we need to be concerned about is, will we see a systematic and radical enough shift in the right direction? And it will take us keeping tremendous pressure on him and his administration to make sure that what he doesn't do is focus on incremental change. 
because we don't need incremental change. We need radical change. And uh, that's why, you know, business organizations like the American Sustainable Business Council are bringing together hundreds of thousands of companies to put this pressure on the administration and to basically make the case that dealing with these problems are good for business in the long term. That in order for business to succeed and thrive and survive, we need to make these systematic changes around social inequity, around climate change. And unfortunately, when you look at the regulatory environment that we've created, particularly in the United States, it has almost institutionalized short-term thinking. And that structure is dangerous. And that structure has been put in place largely by huge multinational companies that have been lobbying aggressively to create rules that allow them to meet their short-term needs for their shareholders. So I am optimistic about this opportunity. I think that it will come, but, but as Dave said, you know, the work in some ways begins once the opportunity unfolds to make sure we seize that opportunity and bring about the kind of change that Forum envisions in the report that they have just shared. And, and just very briefly, before I come back to Ilza, Jeffrey, just one last bit on that is, should we trust business? So, you know, in, and I, I, I know that's a, a very broad question, but even pro what we call progressive businesses that are now sort of standing up for, um, against social injustice, that are speaking up against, uh, uh, for much more pro-sustainability regulatory environments. Do we, should we trust them that they really do understand the scale of what's needed or are they just part of the problem still? Well, as a lifelong business person who has spent his entire career starting companies, I would say don't trust business to regulate and manage itself. It needs a regulatory environment that insists on behavior change. It needs a accounting regime that captures full cost accounting and doesn't let business externalize their costs onto society. So I would say, yes, it's wonderful that all these leaders and businessmen are talking and businesswomen are talking about sustainability and corporate responsibility. Fine, move ahead in that direction and let us change the regulations to ensure that you do what you say you're going to do. Great, thank you. Um, Ilza, I just want to come to you um, around, you know, the, one of the pathways, which, as Sally said, was maybe not a pathway, but maybe everything is this constant change, constant uncertainty. I'm just wondering, given, given that we got so many shocks, so much complexity, do you think that, you know, just this idea of, you know, also short term and long term, do you think that with such uncertainty, that actually helps drive change in the short term? Or does it actually paralyze people? Because I mean, there's, there's, that, there's that choice. It's either going to say, oh my God, we've got to make that leap into the future, or it's going to say, protect. Can you just talk a little about where you see that going? So engrossed in your question, I forgot to take myself off mute. Um, <laughs> um, these are complex questions. Um, so I'm going to come back to the sustainable development goals for, for a good reason, I think, because you know, when, when the UN created them and we worked uh, along with other organizations uh, who are on the line today, I see, to helping bring in the voice of business and the business uh, perspective into creating them. And there was so much pushback against 17 goals, uh, but you need 17 goals for something as complex as what they are trying to achieve. And so I think the way that business and others are grappling with, with the uncertainty is to pick their lane and choose where they can really make a difference. Um, and that, you know, everyone can't do everything um, to just to state the obvious, but a lot of people thought that they did have to address everything and we can't. What we can do is to put our faith, to strengthen multilateral institutions, put our faith in those institutions, choose a roadmap, and then oh, act in concert. I just lost Ilsa there. You did? Um, it's okay. Yeah. And, and 
Um, and I think one of the other things that has helped to galvanize action in the right direction is this focus on impact. And I would say that the COVID crisis has, has really doubled, redoubled everybody's understanding of how tremendously important impact really is. So it's taken everyone's focus, maybe their ego aside a bit and taken everyone's focus to getting results and driving change. And, and therefore they're working together in new collaborations that did not exist previously um, and have, 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 um, have put their competitive concerns aside. Um, and so, you know, I think joining forces, recognizing the unique contribution that, that each kind of entity can make um, is, is going to be really helpful um, and, and, and really the, the way out of the tremendous complexity that, that we're facing. Um, and I just want to give a nod to, to the, the, the tremendous power that young people today have, because if CEOs were uncertain, um, and again, I have a, a bit of a business lens, but government leaders as well are uncertain about where their priorities lie. It's, it's been amazing to watch the extent to which young people and previously disenfranchised people have their voice has been elevated and is being listened to in this country and, and elsewhere. Great, thank you. So, sorry I interrupted you, but I, I, I thought we were all losing connection, but it was just me who lost the connection, so I'm back. Um, Sa Sally, can I just ask you just to address one thing that came up in the questions, which was to give um, it a more sort of international flavor or global flavor in the sense of um, where we're seeing change take place. So, so we're, we're, you, know, we're, you know, when we're in the West, it's very easy to, to think about the West rather than, um, you know, the global South and what's going on in, in other parts of the world. Can, do, you, do you see any within the report sort of a sense of where we're seeing more radical change? Should we actually not be focusing on America and Europe and the West, but actually looking to other countries for uh, encouragement and insightfulness? Yeah, I think that we're seeing signals of this transformed trajectory around the globe, to be honest. I talked earlier about the Hawaiian recovery package. It's a feminist leg recovery package through to a lot of what's happening in Asia. The Singapore government is thinking really seriously about a green stimulus package, for example. And when we were looking for examples of transform, we did find signals in most countries around the world. So for example, in India, there's a wonderful relationship with a development organization and a grassroots organization really trying to drive some serious social equity outcomes. So what you see are kind of vignettes of transform. They're dotted around the world, but to link to a question that I know has come up in the chat, these are flashes of the future that are already here. The reality is we're seeing all of these four trajectories play out simultaneously. And the question in the chat was, can they coexist? And the answer is yes, they are coexisting at the moment. And I think what we're trying to say is that well, two things really. If we find ourselves um, in discipline or compete and retreat, which you know are less aligned with sustainable development, then we need to re recognize that there are light and shade sort of the, each trajectory. So for example, in discipline, the mindset of efficiency, it means that the circular economy will scale. Um, that is consistent with a lot of what we're trying to drive for for sustainability. So I think kind of two important points, the trajectories have got a light and a dark side to them. But the second point is the mindset, that transform mindset. So if you hold in your mind that planetary health equals human health equals social justice, and then actually we can use this moment to create that transform trajectory, even if you find yourself in unsettled or complete and retreat, we can begin to track a pathway forward. And that's certainly what we've seen through all of our futures work that self-fulfilling, self-defeating prophecies, they're real. So if we believe that we can move for, to a different version of the future, then we might well be able to do that. So the trajectories do coexist, but the more attention we pay on transform right now, the more we shine a light on these vignettes of transformation around the world, scale them, the more we believe that that can happen, then we might see that become the dominant trajectory. And, and of course, this is ancient wisdom. I mean, as the Buddha said, if, if we change our minds, the world changes because we're seeing the world differently and therefore we can't help but, uh, but the change will happen because we've already made it happen in our minds. Which actually makes me want to come to you, Roman, because I think it's so wonderful to be a philosopher because you can sit there and just think and 
Uh, all these other people on the call are probably having to act. You know, they're, they're in companies. They're, they're surrounded by uh, all these, all these, uh, uh, you know, busyness and all this stuff happening, and they have to act. And they've got all these colleagues who are who are maybe trying to keep the status quo. Da 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 da. Uh, but it's a serious question because, as a philosopher, you're able, in a sense, to take a meta perspective. You're able to 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 see the entirety of something. And I'm just wondering what that perspective, how, how we can all maybe gain from that perspective of staying, how do we actually really stay optimistic in a, in a true way as opposed to a sort of naive way? How, how, do, how can we see the world differently so that actually we help to create that but not actually pretend? Well, maybe I'm a bad philosopher because I don't just like staying in this little study that I'm in <laughs> and I try to get out into the world, but it's that translation of those big perspectives into genuine change, which is so challenging. And that's what I'm constantly struggling with. So recently I gave, uh, I was involved in giving a briefing to British members of parliament about my book, The Good Ancestor. How can they bring more long-term thinking into government? And I had to think really hard about how to communicate this. And this is partly what the, the issue is. How do we communicate about the trajectories that matter or the trajectories we want to avoid? And the way I went into it in that particular case was, talking about children and talking about grandchildren, the things that I was mentioning a bit earlier, and then using that as a jumping off point for talking about really nitty gritty technical philosophical issues. So for one of them was about the idea of discounting, the way that governments heavily discount the future when they're making long-term investment decisions, for example, in renewable energy, the way the cost benefit calculus is made is that less, uh, less weight is put on the welfare of future people in the same way that people get smaller and smaller the further away from you they are in discounting their welfare becomes smaller and smaller the further away they are from you in time and what i was trying to say to these members of parliament across the political spectrum was that you know this is a form of intergenerational injustice going back to these big ideas that what right have we to um, impose our actions on people who aren't even born yet you know, a, a lot of them. Um, who are we to break the great chain of life or to put it in jeopardy without technological destructiveness and ecological degradation? So we need to have those big ideas, but we also need to marry them with the, or connect them with the very, I mean, sometimes very technical issues about real change that can happen. In this case, I'm talking about the government's discount rate in the UK can be brought down or eliminated when it comes to ecological risk. Because, you know, as the economists say, well, you can discount future generations because future people will have economic growth and they'll be able to deal with their problems and, and, and technology will help deal with climate change. Well, no matter how much money you've got in your pocket, it's not going to reverse the melting of the Greenland ice sheet. So we need those big philosophical ideas about intergenerational justice. Then we need to become master translators, if we can, into political practice. Great, thank you. And Roman, I, I, I just want to ask everyone this question, which is because what, what, what Forum is trying to do is get the cut through. It's, it's great to have the report, but then how do we act on it? So, so Days, for you first, you know, can you talk a little bit about you know, what do you find gets through to people? So what, how are you finding, what, what is it that touches people? What is it that is going to get people to wake up and say, actually, God, I get it, and now I'm going to act? What, what are you, what's your experience of that? Yeah, I think it, it's it's different for different age groups. So with young people, it tends to be that. So I remember the first time I joined XR, they basically told me that it's okay to feel grief around the environment and around what's happened. And that was the first time I actually felt like I was allowed to say, I feel like I've lost something, you know, and especially with young people not knowing how to process that grief and not knowing how to turn that grief into positive change. That is something that I feel like older people need to do. And with the older people, it tends to be actually connecting them to the climate crisis. There are so many different ways and science speaks to some, but not to everyone. And like for me, it's particularly the emotion of you know talking about their grandchildren, talking about their kids um, and seeing how they have such joy in their eyes when they think about their next generations and telling them the reality of what their next generations might make face if they don't act now. And I think that's where it's really getting to 
people's hearts, especially when it comes to business. Because in business, you're told to speak from your role um, as though your role is your entire person. Um, and I think when people start emotionally connecting to the climate crisis and connecting to what's going on and connecting to the grief and the loss and accepting what's happened, but also using that energy to harness something better, that's how we're going to get people going to feeling confident enough to create change. Daisy, thank you. Um, Jeffrey, same to you. I mean, you, you've been in business a long time. You've seen this sort of slow, iterative change. Um, what, what, from a mindset perspective, how do we reach business in terms of driving fundamental change? Because you talk a lot about regulatory change, which is great, but sometimes people have to feel it in their hearts, as Dave says. How are we going to get to that within yeah. business? Probably through their kids. I mean, I think that we need to uh, have young children study systems thinking understand the interrelation and interconnectedness of all things in life, and then to set them loose on their parents, to challenge their parents around what they're doing. I remember a friend of mine uh, who worked for Greenpeace was on a trip with his kids and uh, they drove by some smokestacks with pollution coming out. And his kids said to him, daddy, you're not doing a good enough job. Um, we need, we need, pressure from the younger generation, from the people that Days is working with, I believe that that is the acupuncture point to bring about systemic change. Thank you. And Ilza, uh, same to you. Um, in, in your role and when you're speaking to people, what is it, the one thing you say that just breaks through defenses, breaks through egos, breaks through um, sort of fear? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not what I say, but it's what I, I do call the one-two punch, uh, which I think is very, very powerful. And you hit people with data and then with the emotional um, side of the thing that you're asking them to do. So, for example, I would take what Jeffrey said and, and up at one, I would love to see um, to some of the six-year-olds that Days just referenced talking to some unconverted CEOs. I think that would be really, really, really powerful. Um, so, you know, we can issue reports and calls to action and even regulation, but, um, but um, you know, the, I feel like the changes we've seen around, for example, engaging business on, on women and gender came from some landmark reports, two landmark reports, but then also the, the, the moral and the, and the emotional side, and I guess the mindset, if you will, which is what we're talking about today. Great, thank you. Um, Sally, we're, we're about time, but is there, um, do you want to just have any final comments and then we'll wrap up this session? Yeah, um, there has been a comment on the chat box and it's really relevant to this point. We didn't create a call to action that included education and perhaps we should have done. Um, we do at Forum believe education is super important. We ran a master's in sustainable development for 20 years and we now have the School of Systems Change, which is all about educating change makers to drive systemic change. So we do think it's really important. Um, we just didn't call it out specifically. So I think we may need to shine a light on that going forward. But I guess what I'm struck is struck by is that um, at its heart, I think the big unlock for the transformation that we need to see, and you've all said it in slightly different ways, and so did the panelists yesterday. The panelists yesterday sort of phrased it slightly differently. It was about being a good human. And I think what I've heard today is that caring counts. If we care, we can create change. If we can create change, we can create the future that we want. So just caring is the first step to driving big change. And we can all care. We all have that within us. Great. Um, so um, we can all thank the panel. Thank you, panel. Thank you, panel. Thank you, panel. Um, we're now going to um, have a small break, but before that, um, I just want to let you know what's coming up. So um, we're gonna dive into um, the interactive session where actually uh, we're gonna ask you to discuss what is the one thing or more than one thing that you can actually do to help this transformation. So, so we know we need systemic change. We know we need change of governments and businesses, but also we are human beings on this planet and we can make a difference too. So it's just to look at how we're going to do that.
Um, but uh, so we're going to take, uh, I think it's a two minute break, which is what I asked for, so I can go to the toilet between sessions. So um, some people might want to go to the toilet, some people might, might want to make a quick cup of tea. Um, but while we have a two minute break, what I'd ask everyone to do if, who's sticking around for these two minutes is um, just put in the chat box um, what resonated for you most uh, from this session. And then we're going to have a two minute break now and then we will come back and explain what's going to happen next. So see you. Yeah, and please stay. And um, we've got 40 minutes to run. And this is the really exciting piece. We turn videos on, we see who's in the audience and we really want to hear from you about what you're going to do differently. So do what you need to do. Come back in two minutes. We'd love to see you back. Yes. I'm and, you know, I've I've experienced this hugely. I, you know, I deliberately or go and speak to organizations, individuals that I know don't really believe in the sustainable development goals because they have to be part of the journey. And so that's why in each of these four trajectories, we took the time to articulate their mindsets because if we can understand the mindset that dominates computer and retreat, then that makes it a little easier to reach out and to have that conversation, even though it's difficult, it might be ridden with conflict, but we, we do need to embrace the multivariance in our universe if we're going to drive the change we want to see. Yeah, and, and all those aspects are in us. I mean, it's not like we are the perfect sustainable. We, we are only perfect. Oh, Joe, I else. thought you were. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but, it, but it really is in that sense of actually part of us feels fearful. Part of us wants things to be the same. You know, there's nothing out in the world that's not also in us. And it's only understanding and feeling what other people are feeling that we're able also to feel more human ourselves. But enough Wait. of this, we're being more, we're being too philosophical. Roman is getting bored, I can see that. So um, Sally, do you want to um, talk yes. about the breakout groups? So we would love you to go into a breakout group. You don't need to do anything. Um, Zoom will do the hard work for you. And just spend 15 minutes. Um, there'll probably be groups of four or five. And just think about what you can do personally within your organization, within your sector to help make the transform trajectory a reality. What we would advise you not to do is spend 15 minutes introducing yourselves um, because we really want the act, act ideas for action. Um, but really think about, focus on the word differently. So where's the stretch in what you're doing to really step over what might feel comfortable into what might feel less uncomfortable, but might be more aligned with driving the transformation, the deep change that we need to see. Um, so that's it really, it's very straightforward. We then will bring you back and we will be asking you to share what you're gonna do, diff diff do differently in the chat and calling on a couple of you to share in real time. But it's over to you now to digest everything that you've heard. Think about where's your stretch, where's the edge of your practice to drive the transformation that we need to see. And just, just one last thing. Um, we're going to um, have our, our speakers and the, will be joining different panels and also there'll be forum for the future folk in some of them. So um, it's self-organizing, but uh, there may be someone in your panel from forum who will be able to help guide you. So uh, enjoy this time and we will see you back in 15 minutes. We might all be here, actually, Joe. We'll be here. Great. Fantastic. So um, thank you for all taking part. What we're going to do is um, now we're going to ask you to just uh, go to the chat room and um, just, just write in, actually, what it is you're committing to doing. What do you think? Where do you think you can make the biggest difference in terms of moving us towards this regenerative, transformed future. And, and while you take a couple of minutes to do that, um, I'm just gonna ask a couple of people just to uh, just unmute themselves and just uh, share what they're planning to do. So um, first of all, I wanted to ask Lisa Morden from Kimberly Clark. If you can unmute yourself, just come to the front of the Zoom. Um, and if you're there and just, uh, just tell us a little bit about what you're planning to do. She's here. Hello, Lisa. Are you are you there? If you're there, can you unmute yourself? Or perhaps if 
Ashanti is there. Yes, um, Ashanti from Amidia Network. If you're there, that would be great if you can um, come and say hello. Uh, yes. Oh, I am here. Yay! Hi. <laughs> you're Success. very welcome. <laughs> so Ashanti, just uh, just um, tell us a bit about what you do, first of all, just so we all can put you in context and then just um, it'd be good to know what your commitment is. Yeah, it's happy to. So I am Ashanti Ranasinghe, based in the Bay Area. I work for Omidyar Network, which is a, um, a philanthropic investor, I think is now what we call ourselves. Um, we've been, um, and my work there has been around foresight and future sensing. So I've got to work, I've gotten to work with uh, Forum quite a bit and it's been really nice to work with you all. And this, uh, you know, this, this perspective on transformation, we're feeling such tension and, and um, internally and externally around this. So one commitment that I've been making, which has a, as its own, uh, reaction internally is challenging our own dynamic of power as a philanthropy, as a funder. Um, we've been trying to do this actually for years, but this is the first year that it's really pushed, been pushed to the forefront as we've discussed in this session as well, so much about power dynamics. And, um, and you know, so much of what we discuss even in this group is really us talking about activists and movement builders and other groups that aren't even in the rooms with us a lot of the time. So. Um, we've been testing and have gotten approval, for example, to do a mutual aid uh, fund. This is an area you all probably know of, I think is very much transformational in that, in that realm of thinking. How do we actually get people in society to be able to help each other uh, through a very difficult period, especially in countries where the government is not stepping in to supply support or resources as uh, not at least compared to what is needed. And, um, but you know, that not something that philanthropy actually engages very closely with. And in order to do it well, we have to do a very different form of partnership. We have to bring community members to actually decide how to fund. So there's, um, so that's probably my biggest commitment is continuing to challenge our own idea of what our role should be in the world and trying to actually challenge the power that we bring to the table to seed it as much as possible to people who actually know what the change should be. Wonderful, thank you, Shanti. And, and it, it reminds me of um, that idea that it's always good to come back to the start of the journey, however far down the journey we are, to come back to the start and say, knowing everything I now know, would I still do the same thing or would I behave any differently? So um, thank you for sharing that. Um, Sally, do you want to, I know you're, you, I can see you focusing on, on, the, uh, on the chat. Um, so do you want to give us a sense of what's cool. coming? Yeah, um, so a lot about communication, so speaking with authenticity, um, testing different language is a way of bringing in a broader community into the conversation, um, reframing narratives um, as a way of again reaching a, a wider cohort, and then quite a few about being more radical. Um, and the one, two from Ilza really stuck. So using the one, two to tackle those in power, um, I've got a vision of sort of rugby scrum. Um, I'm quite sure that's what was in mind, but it's kind of tackling those in power. And then um, two very human things that people are suggesting. So gritty hope, very, you know, mirroring a lot of what Tom said yesterday about gritty optimism. And less cynicism, less passivity, passive, anyway, not being so passive um, and just kind of, you know, really sort of telling positive stories of change. I guess that's linked with the narrative point. Um, so some really positive stuff in there for sure. Um, Great. And, and one, one, I want to just because I, I know so it particularly struck me because maybe that's how my mind works, but um, Claire, who wrote, ease with not knowing, holding um, the future with fluidity. I mean, that, that sense of, um, of, you know, just, just not being brittle ourselves, not, um, and, and it, it's, you know, for me, it's, it's very much along with Buddhist philosophy that it's, it's, it's recognizing that as constant change, everything is impermanent. And that if we stay with one fixed idea, one fixed outcome, 
then actually all we're going to do is, is stress ourselves and actually have a, a binary view of it. We can be optimists if things are going our way and pessimists if we're, they're not going our way. But actually, one of the things is actually, how do we transcend the binary and say, and this is what came up yesterday, Sally, about, about how, we, how do we stay the course because we believe in the course, because we know it's true, because we feel it in our very being and not get pulled out by the sense of, are we powerful or powerless? Are we right or are we wrong? Are we, uh, are we is this um, going to work or is this not going to work? Because those are all in a sense circuit breakers that can, that can take our energy out of the system rather than stay focused on, on the direction. But do you, Sally, I mean, what, do you wanna phrase a bit around, around how difficult this path is but, and how we stay on it? Yeah, thank you. Um, it is really difficult. I think that for the last 20 years, we've tackled the low hanging fruit of sustainable development. You know, we've seen efficiency gains, we've seen emissions cut, but not cut enough. Um, they need to be zero when it comes to carbon. And I think we've done the easier stuff. I think that that has got us to where we are right now, which is a moment in time exacerbated by COVID where it's really clear we need systems transformation. We need to change the very, the very fabric, the, the structure of the systems that we rely on. And that's big, deep transformational change. And that isn't easy. Um, but what I would say though, is what we can do in order to sort of find the energy and the power, um, in, in fact, the spirituality, if you will, to create that deep change, is to have that North Star of what we think is possible. And what we are trying to do in the report, particularly in the transform trajectory, is to paint a picture of what could be possible. And I think that if we take the analogy of being at a chasm, um, we've, we've done great work to get to the chasm, we now need to make a big move, a big leap to a different system, a different way of operating. What we're trying to offer in the report is the impetus the vision to make that leap there is something better there there is something that we can create and through shining a light on all these wonderful signals of change as i said earlier from around the world these are little pin these are proof points of what might be possible so for me i don't have a completely clear route map of how to get from where we are to these new reconfigured systems but if I to go back to the analogy of the chasm, I can kind of see a little rope bridge. It's sort of really whipping around in the wind a bit and it's you know quite tentative, but I can see the semblance of a pathway, but it won't be fixed and we're gonna to have to navigate as we keep going. But I think acknowledging that where we are right now is at a pivotal moment in our history as humans and incremental change just will no longer cut it, just locking in the existing systems won't work, fiddling around the edges will not work. We all have to play a role in creating an emergence of a different way of operating and having a strong sense of what that might look like might be the fuel that we need to get us there. Thank you, Sally. And, and, and just to pick up on something, you know, to link that to what Roman was saying, which is that on the other side of that chasm is us. We're on this side and we're on that side. And the rope bridge just leads us to ourselves. It's a, it's, it's a, it's, it's a funny one that. And, and uh, you know, um, I mentioned this yesterday when, when I was doing a lot of personal development work, I was taught that vision is building a bridge across an abyss so that for others to follow, we don't build it for ourselves, we build it for others. And that's uh, coming back to Roman. I also, I just want to pick up one last thing. Um, Days, I, I was really touched by um, what you were saying about Extinction Rebellion and, and about feeling grief. And in fact, just a couple of days ago, someone pointed to an article I uh, wrote in The Guardian, God, six years ago, uh, no, no, uh, yeah, 2014. And, and the first sentence was, is it possible to hold all the grief in the world and not get crushed by it? And, um, and so, so one, one, one of the things I, I want to say is, you know, at, as I said, I'm at Plum Village in France and, um, and, and the first noble truth of Buddhism is that there is suffering. And then the third one is that there's a way out of suffering. Um, and, and the fact is that it's only by going into our grief in a deep way that we come through our grief into a, a brighter future. And, and 
and we built a whole society on trying to bypass our grief and bypass our, our suffering. And all that does is, is deepen it and, and make it harder to, to reach. So that, you know, if we, if we really get into the suffering, really get into the grief, and on the other side is something very, very tender and vulnerable, and it's our humanity, and it's who we are. And when we touch that, then we are at our strongest. We're, we're most deeply rooted in ourselves. And when we're deeply rooted in ourselves, we drive change because people trust us and they know that there's no difference between what we say and who we are. And that's what people are looking for. Um, so, so back to Sally. being good humans. Yeah, I'm just strict back to being the best version of ourselves. Um, what we'd like to do now is very cheekily run the poll again, um, because we want to see whether or not this conversation has made you more optimistic, less optimistic, hopefully not less, but um, kind of where are you now? Having had this conversation, how has your optimism about optimism about our ability to create a better world changed? Um, uh, and you're allowed to be more pessimistic. <laughs> you are, yes. <laughs> there, there's nothing wrong with it. And in fact, we optimism, pessimism, they really aren't binary in perhaps the way that we portray it here. Um, yes. It's about the same as it was at the beginning, actually. Um, so I actually, I, there's yeah, less I, pessimism. <laughs> I th yeah, and I, I think what you were saying, Sally, is, is uh, you know, the poll itself is, is, a, is a, you know, it's problematic in the sense it gives us a quick view, but actually um, we should be both. Yes, and because they, you can't have pessimism without optimism. You can't have optimism without pessimism. They they coexist, and 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 to hold them both, but to know where we stand between them, and to take meaning from that. And some great contributions in the chat. Determination. In the end, it will take our profound determination to drive the change that we want to see. But in the meantime, um, we would like to encourage you to visit our Future Centre. Um, and thank you to Ashanti and Amidia for funding the reskinning of our Future Centre. It looks beautiful. And that's where you can find the report. Please download it. Please share it with your neighbours, your friends, your family, your children, your grandparents, whoever, because we would love to, everyone to read this report and for everyone to share the messages in it and to accept it as a contribution, uh, a small contribution to creating the change that we want to see. And, and yeah, I, I, I sometimes feel events like this are, are like being on a pilgrimage where you walk alone during a day or days and then people come together for an evening uh, um, and, and eat and break bread together. And, and we can't do that, but, but these are like these moments where, where people can get together, can talk, can, um, can think, can uh, review, can take time out. And then we go back and we do the work. And, um, but we need to know that there are other people on the path. And this is a beautiful moment just to, just to say hello to everyone, to recognize we are strong, that we're tender, we're vulnerable, we're powerful, we're, we are all of those things. And to be present and to be brave. With that, um, thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you for giving up two hours of your time. That is yeah. a huge contribution to make. We really appreciate it. And we hope that this afternoon, this morning, has just inspired you to go further and to go faster. And I think I would just leave you with, you know, if not now, when? And if not, us, who? So let's go do it. Yeah. And thank you all so much. And uh, go well. That's Valentina, we'll just switch the slider. Oh no, we'll leave the slide there. I was just thinking we could say goodbye to people. <laughs> I forget we're on Zoom, we're not in a real room. Oh, we've lost the music. Bye everyone. Next time we'll do a disco. Thank you.
you everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you. You're not gonna. <laughs> Obviously not, no. You're braver than me, Sally. Thank you. Pleasure. Go well, everyone.